Alors, bonsoir tout le monde. J'espère qu'on n'a pas perdu trop de, de joie à se sont allés au musée de la civilisation euh, pour la conférence. Alors, ben, bienvenue. Donc, c'est l'avant-dernière de la série des instantanées d'architecture. Et puis, je vais laisser euh, brièvement après présenter euh, nos conférenciers euh, par Samuel. Euh, donc, euh, je remercie, comme d'habitude, nos commanditaires. Donc, euh, Martin Leblanc qui est derrière du Musée de la civilisation, toujours euh, fidèle supporteur des conférences, la Ville de Québec, euh, Soprema qui euh, nous a vraiment aidés cette année et euh, aussi un nouveau commanditaire qui se joint, euh, c'est Lafarge Canada qui se va se joindre pour les prochaines séries de conférences et évidemment l'école avec euh, le travail euh, toujours euh, bien fait de Anne euh, Boisvert. Euh, je voudrais, avant de l'oublier, vous indiquer qu'il y aura, après la conférence, la remise des prix de la charrette du Festival du cinéma de la Ville de Québec. Donc, pendant le cocktail, on va vous interrompre entre deux verres, peut-être. Et, euh, ben, je, je me retiens tellement de laisser à Samuel la présentation qui est bien préparée, seulement pour vous dire qu'on est très heureux de recevoir aujourd'hui nos conférenciers. Euh, pour moi, c'est une réelle inspiration de ce qui se fait mieux à l'échelle canadienne. Peut-être c'est un peu les plus européens de nos architectes canadiens. Et on est très content d'avoir cette représentation donc, de Winnipeg aujourd'hui. Alors, je laisse Samuel présenter nos gentils conférenciers que je remercie vraiment de se joindre à nous ce soir. Merci Jacques. Bonsoir à tous. Euh, donc, c'est avec grand plaisir que nous recevons ce soir euh, Johanna Ourmé et Sacha Radulovic de 5468796 Architecture. Euh, donc, un nom qui peut sembler un peu surprenant, mais qui correspond en fait euh, à leur numéro d'enregistrement euh, de compagnie. Donc, une idée fortement originale, mais un peu difficile à retenir par cœur. Euh, <rire> donc, fondée en 2007 à Winnipeg, euh, l'Agence fait la promotion d'une approche collaborative entre ses nombreux membres, qui sont maintenant plus de 20, et euh, leur production a clairement catalysé une nouvelle vague d'architecture contemporaine à Winnipeg. La firme a été qualifiée par le Architectural Review comme la nouvelle firme d'architecture la plus excitante au Canada depuis plus d'une décennie, une firme vouée à appliquer l'innovation en design, même dans les tâches les plus humbles, et résolument pleine de ressources pour construire avec élégance. Donc, c'est un grand témoignage. Euh, en 2012, l'agence a été sélectionnée pour représenter euh, le Canada lors de la 13e Biennale d'architecture de Venise avec leur exposition « Migrating Landscape euh, ». Puis en 2013, ils ont été choisis par le Conseil des arts ca du Canada euh, comme récipiendaire du prix de Rome professionnel en architecture pour leur projet de voyage et de recherche « Table pour 12 ». Leur travail est bien sûr publié euh, sur toutes les grandes plateformes web et les revues euh, d'intérêt en plus d'avoir reçu un nombre impressionnant de prix et distinctions, autant à l'échelle canadienne qu'internationale. Originaire de la Finlande et de la Serbie, respect, euh, respectivement, Johanna et Sacha ont tous les deux étudié à l'Université du Manitoba euh, et maintiennent en fait que leur regard externe euh, leur a permis de plus facilement briser le moule euh, de l'architecture en contexte canadien. Euh, donc, je vous invite sans plus tarder à accueillir chaleureusement Johanna Ourmé et Sacha Radulovic. Excuse me. Good evening. Uh, can you hear us okay? Good. That was all the French you're going to get from us today. Yeah, so I apologize in advance, but uh, we're both immigrants. We can hardly speak English, never mind French. So <laughs> thank you for entertaining us in, in that. Um, again, a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for having us. Um, we, uh, we started in Winnipeg in 2007, uh, you know, and hope that to do something uh, inspiring in architecture and not finding many opportunities in our former uh, former employees, and this is just an image of our office. In former employment, not employees, employers. Uh, employers, yes. And so, anyway, um, and it's been a huge team effort, so even though we're standing up here, there's a, there's a number of people who are, are behind us. But we really wanted to focus on today is is thinking about, of course, you know where Winnipeg is, but thinking about is in the beginning as a sort of um, back, uh, what's the right word? I have no idea what you're trying to say. Like backyard of, 
backyard of architecture, like not, not a really good place to, to do so. We were sort of bummed by the, you know, like sometimes you get these extremes of weather and what can you do in that? Uh, architecture was hardly ever recognized. We had a few, few examples, uh, uh, sort of class A or capital A architecture with, with recent buildings, but majority of what the city looks like is this. Um, so it was really not a very inspiring environment to, to begin a practice uh, then, 10 plus years ago. Uh, we also, uh, are our friends left. So we used to call uh, Vancouver, Winnipeg West and, and London, England, Winnipeg East because there were more of our graduates, our peers in those two cities than there were left in Winnipeg. And uh, well, this is very much like Quebec City yesterday, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, we tended to think that the city really gets dump on and it's sort of unusable. What are you pressing there? There's some, some slides are messed up, so it's you're good. Okay, well anyway, um, and uh, again, that it's, it's not only cold, but it's very sort of beige, that it's boring and there was not much going on. On the surface. On the surface. We also had this uh, dubious title of having the most surface parking lots per capita in the world. And so our downtown is not like yours, it's, it's pretty, pretty lousy. Um, and so the question is really uh, if you know, why Simpsons asked that question, would you right? be in Winnipeg? Even Homer Simpson was wondering. But then uh, I guess what happened is that we started thinking about, and, and you're going to wonder why I'm going through these slides again, but why, like, why not make it into an opportunity that Winnipeg's actually a very isolated city and this is good. We're eight hours away from our closest big city, which is Minneapolis, eight hours south by car, that there's something about learning to build architecture in the extremes, uh, because if you can build an envelope that stands in this climate, then you can do it anywhere. And that operating in those margins of architecture is actually an opportunity that we can turn into advantage. Um, and so once we <coughs> came to the realization that this is actually <coughs> a huge opportunity, it's a blank canvas for us to operate on, that sort of sh shifted the way that we think about our context. And then all of a sudden we thought, okay, so we have this return on investment in design that's higher than elsewhere because if we can take what we have, which is small opportunities and turn them into something, we're going to make a bigger difference. Um, we can find perhaps places where architecture wouldn't normally occur uh, and that's going to be a benefit we are going to somehow find the spaces in between our projects that we're not paid to do, but uh, if we can affect, the city will be better and our environment's going to be better. And then we also started believing that we can make a difference beyond just building architecture and building projects that are physical practice work, but that we can uh, make a difference in our culture in a, in a bigger way. Um, and we're not going to talk about any of these projects. These are just some of the projects that uh, we have done in the past and you may have seen somewhere a few places to, to get published. We stumbled upon doing a lot of housing work in the beginning, multifamily housing. And this is something that's sadly lacking in Winnipeg. Uh, we have, we're one of the least dense cities in the entire world, uh, meaning that there's an all a lot of vibrancy on the street and most people live in mech mansions out in the, than the sprawling suburbs. Um, but uh, sort of being able to take a crack at what design can do uh, for housing and convince people that you can live smaller, you can live tighter uh, if you focus on the design quality was something that we were able to sort of demonstrate uh, through some of our projects. We also tend to analyze everything very, um, very concisely numbers, methodically numbers. So whenever we were to get a hold of a sort of a new client, we would, we would jump on them and say, yes, we can make your performance, your numbers, your profit work. Uh, and, and once we do that, then there's a little bit of room for architecture. And that's an opportunity that even in a culture where architecture is not appreciated, uh, is a convincing, um, convincing statement. Oh, Do you want to talk in. about this? I'm back on. No, go ahead. You're doing so well. Oh, I, yeah? I'm really right. enjoying this. Okay. Well, uh, I, I'm not sure where this is going, but uh, we were recently 
in um, South America. South America. We were in Peru, and we were marveling at the walls there, which had you know two lines. So you have the concrete, and then if it's really fancy, once you have a bit more money, then you do a render like a stucco, colored stucco on top. So there's three lines in your drawing when you do the pr production of architecture, and and what really sort of I don't know, I guess it's upsetting almost, is that this is sort of the buildup of what happens in, in Winnipeg. We, we build things out of wood because that's the cheapest way to build. We have a bunch of Ukrainian and, and German immigrants who know how to swing a hammer, but we don't have any masons, so concrete's out, uh, brick is out, um, and then you add these layers and you sort of wonder, like, what is the, what is the truth in architecture? What's the sort of a wholeness in it. Uh, you can't what see is a half wall of it. Uh, when you can punch your fist through it? Um, so we didn't grow up this way either, but so that's, yes, that is sort of the point. And then also because of our soil conditions, which is a former lake bottom, 35% of our buildings are completely invisible because we spent so much money and effort on the foundation. Uh, everything, including your individual house, has to be on piles that are often 40 feet into the ground. What are you looking at? What the project is. Oh. Well, anyway, and then, so then we come to the, uh, the, the choices that we have. So we have stucco, popcorn stucco. We have um, hardy, board. hardy board siding that often looks like wood which is great, just, just, um, just like here, a little li nicer, I would say. And then we have some sort of metal panel. And so then those are the ingredients of architecture. So you have to make the profit work. You have to use one of these materials. Um, you definitely can't use masonry and so on. And so this sort of rudimentary nature of what, how to boil design down is something that we used to be upset about and we used to complain about, that we can't afford to do architecture until we realized that it's actually the other way around. We gotta learn to do architecture because of these limitations and we can do it better because we know these limitations and can work with them. And then, uh, this is just a little side note, but since then we've been experimenting on different ways to think about facades and use those three types of materials from you know, metal screens to, um, to different sort of sequential cladding uh, systems, uh, sort of systems thinking on how um, a structural frame becomes a screen, becomes a device for, for light to filter through. Um, again, how cladding itself is, is conceived the structural material, uh, what are the sort of details that capture the light quality that we have in our city that's actually very beautiful, and what can you do with things like hardy board that's sort of unexpected. So there's a sort of economy in, in thinking about these things that has been driving uh, many of our projects that uh, we've been doing. And then of course windows uh, in housing architecture in particular is something that you have a certain rhythm. You have so many bedroom windows, you have so many living room windows. So what can you do with that uh, that's going to create a new condition, create something that's going to be slightly more interesting and c we can break new ground in, in thinking about how, how those things could work. There's way more of these slides than I thought. Anyway. You're doing so well. So I, I guess I'm thrown in to talk about a, a first project we we're going to talk about. We're, we're just in the midst of it. And the, uh, I think here we wanted to speak about uh, not necessarily return on investment, but, uh, but really on finding opportunity for architects as well. This project is a former pumping station, so it's supposed to pump water into, the, um, in a, into our old downtown and uh, protect it from from fire that way. It actually never ran. It was built after Chicago fire. It never actually was used, which is good for Winnipeg. But it, was, it was empty for the last 50 years. And the, there's a number of developers that have tried to, uh, tried to develop about, I think there was 17 attempts in 14 years, and the, none of them was able to, to, to crack the uh, finances behind it. So the, we heard that was, they're going to give it one last shot, and uh, we said, well, we're going to give it a try. But you so have to understand that 100 years in Winnipeg is really old. Like, that right. is the prime. This and, is a and very, very old building. <laughs> not necessarily and true for Quebec. And the, uh, so it was, it, was, it was curious. We, we did not want to lose this building. Both Johanna and I live nearby, and the, uh, it's kind of right in the middle of uh, between our two homes. And the, um, 
And the, the, we understood the city who owned it would give it one more shot. So the, uh, we, we started looking at it as we as architects, as we learned, as Johanna mentions, we've learned from other developers on how, how their numbers work. We've developed a financial performer and approached a couple developers that we worked with in the past and said, there's a project here, guys, you might want to do it. And so it took about two years for them to negotiate uh, with the city after that. And the, um, the, I guess these four diagrams will, will, will speak to the fact that we did not want to demolish it. We discovered there was uh, capacity in the building that nobody else discovered in terms of foundation um, loads. Uh, there, there are cranes in the building that actually impose new loads that nobody was aware of, and the, we've used that to add floors in, into the building. Uh, we, preserve, sorry, we preserve it as a jewel, um, and the, uh, decided to build around it. So the, two la the last slide shows um, the proposed additions, if you wish, or the proposed... You uh, should sound slightly more adjacent excited. Buildings. Yeah. Anyway, so the, uh, this really shows the building. It has a very deep foundations. Uh, it's a raft foundation. In our city, you can either build a two-meter thick foundation and hope the building floats on the, uh, what they call, lunchet, uh, or as, as a sort of as, as the soil, or you can put it on pile. So this building was built on, on, on that raft foundation. And the, uh, but what we've discovered is the, is the fact that the, the gantry cranes that were installed in order to move pumps and to, um, to install them in place were actually adding There's additional point loads all around the, the building that you can see. Oh, the slide is actually pretty good. So okay. that allowed us to sus suspend a completely new floor on that structure and therefore make it financially viable. Create a bit of a public space in there so people can see. We created this rendering in order to sell it to the developer and to the city and say, hey guys, you might want to be able to do this. In the, uh, in the place. So the, the space has just been finished. We haven't looked at it inside. So we haven't photographed it inside. Uh, but in order to make the entire project work and pay for the land and so on, we had to add two buildings, one on a either side of the, uh, of the pumping station, therefore creating sort of a more of a space that contributes to the city with, with uh, alleyways and streets and entrances and so on. So this is sort of a I don't know what to call it, like a developed panorama of the space. On the left is a building that's Develop going on the... Developed panorama? Did I say developed panorama? That's what I heard. That's the word, yeah. Okay. The, uh, that's probably I didn't know the that word. was a word. I said panorama. Oh, okay. I think. Anyway, so on the left is, is, a, is a duo of residential buildings. The middle is the, uh, the existing pumping station, uh, which is converted into office and a restaurant. And on the right is the, uh, a single tower single tower building. So the two new buildings sort of frame this, uh, the existing building, but we're really interested in, and Johanna alluded to that, is the spaces that are getting created between the buildings. So we've tried to elevate the, uh, the structures and make them um, sort of introduce people in between the spaces under the buildings, uh, generate places that are going to so provide a bit of stickiness in this part of the town that uh, we're missing. So people will actually come and visit and, and linger and so on. So it's really getting into complexity of the project. Uh, the interior of the build, existing building is completed and we're just breaking ground on the first tower and the, uh, hopefully it's gonna be done in about a couple of years. So when you come to Winnipeg for your holidays, you can actually see it. But this is sort of the space under the buildings where we're trying to, one of the things that we've done with this project is we try to pull circulation outside. So all the, um, all the access to units is from outside, from catwalks and so on. And you know, it, it might not make as much sense in, in, in other places. In Winnipeg, the, uh, any activity is a good activity. Like seeing a garbage truck on the street means it's vibrant. And the, uh, so delivery trucks, people getting to their suites, uh, people looking through their windows, you know, hanging around, lingering around, just creating a place in which they could actually be part of the city is what we're after. So we've experimented with exterior walkways on a couple other projects. It worked out, so that's, that's what we're doing here. So here you can see sort of a ground floor plan and uh, hopefully you can understand how much of it is actually dedicated to public and to people to be able to um, to walk through around in between and so on. So the, uh, hopefully it's gonna generate a, um, or become a place of, for people to come in. This is a rendering of what it looks like inside. Those are the pumps. Pumps are actually made by same people that um, build the Titanic engines, which was, uh, which was very curious. And they were the only thing that was protected inside the building. So everything else that we were able to preserve is a bonus. So you can see that we've opened the roof, installed skylights in order to make the uh, very deep floor plate work. And the, uh, actually did a very, very inexpensive interior, again, capitalizing on the beauty of the, uh, of the existing pumps and brick texture. This is sort of the building on the, uh, on the east. 
showing the views, uh, showing the facade that faces the river, and then this again highlights the, uh, the spaces in between that are happening always between new and old and old and new. So I know it's again. really hard to tell, but we're actually really excited about this project. <laughs> I've been working on it for five years, so maybe not as excited, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but from, from outside, I, it looks really the, great. I think huh? the point is that even when there isn't an architectural opportunity, somebody's not coming to you to hand you a project and say, like, work on this and make it amazing. There's ways that you can go out there and, and find opportunities. And, and even in this case, we're able to put together the team uh, the right players at the table to be able to create a project for, for us. So that's really, I guess, the point there. Was uh, that really that boring? And that, yeah, yeah, it was kind of down yeah, there. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, and then the other part was that, that within each project, there's an economic opportunity that I think you can turn into an architectural opportunity. If you find the right pieces, in this case, those cranes that were existing and had the structural capacity that nobody else had thought of. And so, that's, I think, is the, is the message. So exciting. Yeah, well, anyway. But um, I think the other, um, other responsibility I almost feel like we as architects have is to try to create culture where it doesn't exist. Or in our case, in Winnipeg, where architecture was long perceived as not being part of the culture, is to try to reintroduce it to, uh, to the sort of common folks' consciousness. And... Um, it was interesting when we when we thought of that, we just found a whole bunch of other architects that wanted to, to work with us, work together and make the, the place better, right? Yeah, that's so... That's important to mention, not, not taking a credit for... No, 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 no. no. Okay. So, I mean, several things have happened in Winnipeg over the last 10 years, and I think what's happened is that all of a sudden now, people are taking pride in what we have to offer uh, culture-wise. So there's anything from the warming huts competition that you may have heard of, and, and some of you might have participated, and if you haven't, do it next year. So people get to build these warming huts on the frozen river. We have a river restaurant that actually welcomes people, like New York Times wrote about it. What does um, that mean? Is the restaurants built on the river during winter, yes. right? And there's an architectural competition for its design and, and people dine out in the minus 30 weather and it's kind of very cool. Um, and, and then cold. And cold. And so cold. Frank Gehry did one, and Pat Cows did one, and Atelier Big City from Montreal did one, and Canva won one, and so on. So and that then it's, of course it's been we a real source of dialogue about architecture. We tried to teach, and we tried to sort of participate in architectural competitions around the world. Uh, uh, Venice Biennale, I think, was mentioned in the, uh, in the intro, so tried to spread the... Again, it wasn't about necessarily about going to the Biennale, but it was about trying to spread the Biennale message across the country by having not only the one show in Venice, but having nine different shows and exhibitions of young architects' work across the, across the country. Um, and then, then we took that to the Pre de Rome project where we went to learn about architecture culture in cities where it's thriving, uh, where we thought we could learn lessons from. So we visited New York, Sydney, Lisbon, Copenhagen, Tokyo, Mexico City, and Rotterdam in the effort to gather together developers, media people, uh, architects, uh, uh, other sort of uh, city builders alike to try to see... No? And politicians yeah. in some cases to try to see what there is driving the design culture. And we learned all kinds of things. You know, sometimes it's about having sort of an architectural hero. Sometimes it's about having, you know, government funding for it. Sometimes it's about having really strong voices when it comes to design review processes and, and such things. And then we th really thought, well, we have to make a splash of this uh, as we come back to Winnipeg after the year of, of touring and learning, and then organized an event called Table for 1200, which was 1,200 people dining on the river, talking about design and design culture. And it was a huge success, and now is an annual event in, in, uh, at the end of May in Winnipeg. So again, once you do your trip to Winnipeg, come at the end of May and participate in Table for 1,200. It's a fundraiser for design and architecture in the city. So. And then the next year, we went on to do a project called Share Your Idea. And this was something that we uh, wanted for the entire public to participate in. They had to send in an idea of how they would propose to improve the city uh, for $30,000. And they would pay $25 registration fee to have an idea, and then they had to write it on Twitter length on a, um, on a chair and place that in the public realm. So all of a sudden, we would then have all these urban ideas in the city, people sitting around debating them and thinking that they may have a better idea yet. 
um, and that's the mayor there. Uh, he was sort of the spokesperson then in the end for the, pro for the project. And we had, uh, I think, 750 ideas at the end uh, that he could then take and actually maybe realize some. We did realize the winning. But an anecdote is kind of interesting because the, the city wanted to charge us permit permission to put these chairs onto the onto the sidewalks, which equaled the entrance fee. So actually we- 25 end, bucks a chair, yeah. So they wanted to charge us permission, so we went rogue and, and, and said, no, we're not gonna put any chairs out. We put them all out there and nobody actually picked up on it because it was a relatively short period of time. But that's sort of the, the thinking that we're, we're fighting against, so we're trying to change. Yeah. Despite of having mayor being a poster child for it. And then last year, um, <coughs> we launched something called Design Quarter Winnipeg, and this is a very sort of commercial idea, but it is is uh, taking its, its cue from Design District in Helsinki, my, my hometown, uh, where when I visit, I pick up a map that identifies all the creative makers in the city, and then you can tour the city uh, in a walkable district, uh, so about two kilometer radius, uh, and find those makers and, and, and local producers. And so I thought, well, why not in Winnipeg? Um, and then drew that same circle over the the uh, Winnipeg map and found that no, there, there is some dots on the map that's coming up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> there's not anything there. I'm sorry. It was a great idea, but it didn't work out. Um, <laughs> no. So anyway, so we already had this concentration of actually creative makers, and they were all trying to do their own advertising and get the word out there. But we thought, okay, they could benefit from the collective marketing, and and uh, it launched with 45 businesses members last year and we are up to 65 right now. Uh, developed a business plan for it and at 100, um, and we hired an executive director, so there's somebody full-time running it, she's amazing, makes it all happen. Uh, I'm the chairman of the board, but I don't have to do anything, it's great. Chairwoman, chairwoman. Chairwoman, yes, yeah. Anyway, um, and at 100 businesses, once we get up to that point, then we'll be completely self-sufficient when it comes to uh, funding. Um, and anything from Australia to, to uh, German publications have now come to Winnipeg to visit the design quarter and it's been written about across the world, so it's kind of awesome. I'm not going to talk about this. Should I talk about this? No. Well, anyway, uh, other skip things over, like, skip over slides? yes, so I'm volunteering at the MAA on the MAA Manitoba Association of Architects to try to improve our conditions as architects on, on trying to convince the city that they should hire the cheapest designer, but they should hire the best quality, the best... Um, and um, pay for it. And pay for it, because I mean, in the long run, whether it's during the construction period alone or whether it's the operational cost over the life cycle of the building, you actually end up saving money. And this doesn't seem to get into anybody's head, and um, I don't know why, but it's a long battle. We keep fighting it. People fix roads and potholes like this, band-aid solutions, as opposed to looking at the long-term economics. I still think that uh, Frank Lord Wright said it the best. Uh, this is kind of at the core of the idea that we can do so much more on paper and so much cheaper and we can improve the quality. If we want to pay for that time, uh, which is a small investment, then we're much better off as a society, as taxpayers in the, in the long term. Back to me. Yeah, Something yeah. really boring now. Again. <laughs> so uh, sp speaking of unlikely context, so just a few blocks away from the first project we talked about, this is a project where we completed with the uh, friend of ours, the developer. I think we only had twice a client come in and say, we want you guys because of what you do, not because you're an architect that's first in the, in the phone book. So the, uh, this project's right on the edge of, I guess, highway? It's not even edge of downtown, it's sort of Peter's, away, Peter's out. It, it, it is what used to be a red light district, uh, right? Um, and then there's a highway, as you can see it, crossing around. It's in the back of a bunch of industrial buildings and in behind the, one of our projects, which is these little cubes stacking around. So it had no actually street frontage. It's sort of the, the, the highway is actually elevated at the site already. So it, it really had, had to be either inverted or, as we um, discovered, lifted above, the, above its context in order to produce a value of any sort. So you can see the context is, is mostly backs of industrial buildings without any architectural appeal, if you wish, or any appeal for the community in itself. So once we decided we have to lift it, 
basically uh, the game became how do we, this, do we do this most efficiently. So we tried a few options, of course, and discovered that the circle is 30% smaller, the envelope of the circle is 30% smaller for the same volume than the square. I you might all know that. I don't think that's the story. I think the story no? is that the, the public corridor is also... Sure, we'll get to that. There's, yeah. there's a slide for that. There's right? a slide for that. Yeah, I'm pretty there's sure there's a slide, slide for that. that. Anyway, so the, uh, the building ended up being 62 is its address, 62 McDonald. It ended up being an elevated building in circular shape. In we order have to no new ideas. We just na number everything. Just number everything. So the... Um, and then really once the entire exercise of sort of making it more efficient uh, led to... Um, to, an to a new understanding of what the building is. So here you can see it sort of in, uh, in its elevated sectional, sectional form. One of the things that we did in order to sell these condos is rented a crane and took a panorama so you can see the view from the building. And there it is seen from the, uh, from the highway there. That's a rendering still. So trying to fit housing into that was quite curious once we decided that was actually a shape that might make sense but was was what was the discovery was that usually in an, any apartment if they're square and they're most, most of the time they're rectangular or square you have a certain amount of windows that you need for that apartment and as you get further deeper into the apartment in north america in a typical corridor setup is you get darker and darker and then you get end up with a whole bunch of um, ancillary spaces if you wish that are sort of less qualitative so by taking pie shape uh, slices or pizza slices out of this, we were able to maximize the perimeter where we had the bedroom and the living room and then minimize the amount of square footage and therefore uh, what we think is produce value for our clients. So the, you can see here the uh, one of the suites. Uh, this one has a tub in the middle, but that's sort of a storage wall that, that contains the kitchen bathroom and the uh, and all other utilities and storage. Murphy bed and the unit is entirely open and as you can see here, how it actually opens from that Swiss knife, call it. Well, a, and then uh, you separate the That separates the, the, the back of the, and the front of the unit. And here you can see how that actually uh, functions as a, with a Murphy bed. These are 600 square foot units um, or suites. And trying to um, convince Winnipeggers that you could live in slightly smaller space. I think yeah. the average is that um, in the 1950s, we each used to occupy about 250 square feet per person. And today in Winnipeg, the number is over 900 square feet. And that is just not sustainable in our, in our city or the future of the planet and so forth. And so our, our I guess, mission is to try to convince people that there's other alternatives. So we can only do that if we design, if we design architecture, we think, that actually overcomes those, those kinds of... Um, or that perception, if you wish. It's unsustainable. To build and large, sorry, it's unsustainable I to for all the embedded energy, unsustainable for all the maintenance, heating, cooling, yes, and I so on. Yes, I have just another quick point. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that families need to live this way. I'm only saying that uh, the largest demographic since the Confederation in Canada now is singles. 28% of Canadians are single-family households. And so we don't have housing options for that segment of the population. Or we don't to think the scale, about it. Uh, that okay. we should. So the building, I think this is an important lessons, lesson for students. We designed this building in 2010 and we still have not finished landscaping uh, on it. So it's taken about eight years to, from, from the beginning to the end. And the, the key in it was really the contractor, uh, the, the, the fellow that ended up building it, uh, could do concrete, could, could, could do steel, and he was prefabbing. He does prefab construction, as in sort of um, IKEA type things where he builds walls and then just ships them to the site. So he actually built the entire building on the ground, as you can see it on the, uh, that's one unit, cast the concrete columns, you can see on the right, uh, lifted those up and he connected them with a the steel frame. And the, the key in the building was the fact that it actually ended up being only a three-story building, even though it's 80 feet tall. Um, you can see columns on his yards as he was precasting them there. Uh, three-story building making it possible to be constructed in wood. Uh, which again, uh, in return, uh, has all kinds of savings when it comes to installations and ele electrical, mechanical, and so on. So the, uh, we have basically ended up using three structural systems, concrete, wood, and steel, each one uh, doing the maximum um, of its potential and, the, uh, and therefore allowing us to, again, be as, as uh, sort of, I don't want to say inexpensive, economical as you wish. The, uh, the circle we can't afford on a project like this um, Curved glass, curved glass, like or, or <laughs> sections. So we've tried to 
to sort of camouflage that. That's why where this, uh, the system of fins was, de fins was developed. This is a picture from the, uh, from the construction of the building. There it is hovering in the, uh, this is sort of it in, in situ still resting sort of in the middle of the, uh, the very industrial area. This is, a, I mentioned, um, a building where we experimented with the exterior corridor. So the corridor is very short, uh, given that there's 40 suites, 20 on each floor, and the, um, and its exterior, and it creates a very curious condition at minus 40 and howling winds. Uh, but the, it is kind of like Quebec City yesterday, yeah, or this morning, yeah. But yeah. It, it sort of generates the our intent, like a government, Canadian government. Sometimes in the 50s, we haven't discovered this document, but there's been a lot of talks about it. Has tried to put people inside or keep people inside the buildings because they thought outside is dangerous, scary, and people will freeze to death. So that's why Winnipeg sort of has the plus 15, and Calgary has a plus 15 system where people are kept inside or underground or inside or uh, in in condition spaces all the time. And that's we've we've noticed that with warming huts and the river trail, people actually wanting to come out in winter and uh, and play. And be part of the uh, be part of the city. So again, here's an attempt to um, to do that on a, on a residential level. And here you can see it seen through the UQ project that we did uh, with the same client and the uh, couple other sort of architectural porn shots what? of what it looks like. It, it isn't really properly photographed yet, so they're all very poorly done. So the okay, so this is kind of curious and interesting. So I'll go back here. This so goes back to your holiday plans again. Nope. In what respect? Well, once they come to Winnipeg. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So what happened is the client, who is, the, who is a friend of ours, owed us about 100, 100K for quite a long time. Uh, and we're talking about a couple of years. And so we kind of weathered through it as a, as a small business and so on. We said, okay, Mark, you've got to pay up something. So see that little glass box on top? We said, we, we went to our engineer and said, you know, does the foundation have a capacity to add another floor? And they said, yes, in that concentrated area. So Mark, you should give us ability to build on top of this building for free. And he, you know, after some humming and hawing, he said, okay, I'll give you that because I owe you so much money. So He we only gave it to us because he would have had to otherwise have to pay 15 grand for the roof. Oh, yeah, there's that And well. this way we took that uh, um, sort of responsibility from him. So we end up building this box that we uh, now own as a, as, a, as a sort of an investment that we built relatively inexpensively that, that contains... Um, it's basically a little hotel room with a sauna and the uh, and beautiful views of the city. Uh, and it's been a money-making proposition for us as it actually rents well. Well, the thing is that it's on Airbnb. And That's while not we, its intention, we're not, right? We're not sort of trying to sell that per se. Is that we're trying to get people to appreciate the city. So whenever we have a special guest or we have somebody uh, You mean visiting, university has a special guest? University has a special guest. The symphony has a special guest. They stay here. Uh, we can offer it uh, basically for free because we have four nights per month that somebody else pays for to stay there, and that covers the cost. So this is our attempt at contributing again back to the city with, uh, with sort of accommodation that is a celebration of Winnipeg. I think that's my point. Um, all right, so um, again, not talking about this project, but talking about activism. When we, um, when we did the Old Market Square stage, which is probably one of our more public projects, uh, these were some real quotes from people who uh, visited the site early on. So it was very controversial. Uh, there was architectural press that was sort of praising it, and then there were the regular folk who um, renamed it the Cheese Creator, and there was an actual Facebook page that was about trying to get the thing demolished. And so we got hate mail, and it was real sort of opposition. But we really thought that what was valuable about all of that, and this was in, I think, two. 2010, was that all of a sudden we were having a conversation about the value of architecture in the city for the first time for since we'd been there. Uh, and it was really heated and nobody was left cold. They all had an opinion about whether the cube should or shouldn't be and whether it was successful or wasn't successful. And um, that was a real sort of uh, contribution back to what we thought, you know, architecture could really sort of thrive to be in, in the city. Taught us that uh, actually yeah. if you do something that, that, that generates discussion, actually will help architecture come become part of Not the that cultural we would conversation. Not bad architecture just to have a conversation. No. But well, anyway. we're succeeding at it. <laughs> uh, so our first project, uh, Further Field, now stepping out of Winnipeg and seeing what the lessons that we learned in that particular context, how they could be transported to other locales, 
Um, we were fortunate enough to be hired by the uh, Calgary Municipal Land Corporation for uh, something that, uh, you know, really tiny project. So this is East Village, uh, east, of uh, east of downtown Calgary. And the entire site, I don't know how many acres it is, is coming up basically out of the ground with massive buildings and so on. And so they called us up and said, you know, Stantec, who was doing all of the development along the riverbank, had basically uh, said that they'll just order this shed from uh, Rona to put on the site because they need a garden tool shed. And um, the project leader there thought that we could do slightly better. <coughs> um, so we got a budget of 75,000, which was to include our fees and, uh, and basically to build a shed to house community garden tools. Um, and then umming and awing about it for a while and having a couple of different proposals, which I won't get into, we came to the conclusion that in order for us to have any sort of quality, uh, Any structure, for that matter. Structure right, no? is that we had to we had to use prefab something. So C cans, C cans. Every architect uses C cans at some point, so at least we got it out of our systems. But um, we had this epic argument, and and you can imagine we tend to argue. Um, but um, Sasha was talking about how the thing had to be like an attractor, like in Odyssey two. What is it? Odyssey two thousand. This is object. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Anyway, uh, there's this attractor, and he's like, oh, it has to be like that, like this, you know, object that you're really drawn to, and it should have that dynamic. And I was talking about how it had a civic presence, and that you could go in it and be under it and be part of it. And we were throwing pens at each other. Like, it was getting violent. This was day three. And then finally, um, our third partner, thank God for him, walks in and says, that I think you guys got, you both already have I talk about the about. same thing, no? Yeah. Talking about the same thing. Anyway, so that got resolved. And so now what we ended up with is that we have three C cans, and over them is, is sort of this idea of stretching uh, the corrugated metal skin and blurring it and building onto it, and then stretching the metal structure as far as our budget could go. So this is a formula basically how far can, how deep does the steel have to be, how thick does it have to be, and then how far can we stretch it, so how much area can we cover um, within the budget that we had. And so it became sort of uh, really an exercise of, of let's stretch it as far as we, we can, and then at the same time, you know, people could occupy it underneath. One of the sea cans was a storage shed, as we talked about for those tools. One is a working place where in the, in the, um, during the rain, they could still, community members could work in there, and the third one was the house uh, storage for the chairs and tables um, in, the, in so, the site. So I think what was interesting here, why by going outside of what client needed, they actually got more than they, uh, than they bargained for. Um, for us, the advantage was they, they handed us or they gave us a $50 million project a year later. So that was sort of the, um, what, what, uh, how much it actually meant to us to do um, that. I don't know about this title. Okay, then quickly. Well, okay, Hide so it. I guess quickly. So uh, the other thing that I think architects should do more is get into politics and get involved in, in how we build cities from unexpected areas. So I'm, I'm now the chair of the board of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce uh, somehow and uh, invented this uh, food for thought segment. So this is like the biggest business minds, like, you know, think of guys in suits and uh, so on, uh, to gather for lunch every month. <coughs> and I have somehow managed to convince them that I should deliver this three-minute uh, talk at every luncheon uh, as the chair. So it's called Food for Thought, and uh, this is just an example of, of what I would then do in three minutes, talking about Winnipeg being the least dense city in the world compared to Helsinki, where uh, half as dense our downtown is seven times looser. So yes, we have a lo long way to go on how we should build the city because there's actually an economic case for density that we don't think about in many of the Western cities for sure. Um, and <coughs> always serving the idea that there, it's the numbers that speak for it. We're not trying to sell design quality. I'm trying to sell them the business case actually. Uh, so increased sales for pedestrian environments, uh, things like uh, retailers tend to overestimate the importance of car. You know, you're walking around in old Quebec City, that that is what we're looking for, not how fast you can drive through a city. But Winnipeg, Calgary, um, Saskatoon, Regina, for that matter, none of them get that. And so it's about trying to sort of get in there, get the architectural ideas crossed, not through 
architectural ideas or the theory of architecture, but through the business um, case of it. So doing a lot of research, trying to sort of uh, get the message across. And at that point, uh, Winnipeg was pitching for Amazon. And even there, the talk was about walkability, cycling, infrastructure, transit systems, and so on. You left that in. I did. I oh. guess we're going to talk about that project. Well, go quickly. Boring. Getting bored. No, are you getting bored? We can stop anytime. There's projects. Like no, 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 don't talk about that. Goodness, I'm not going to Yeah, right. That's not the number of slides. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, what's interesting, out of this entire thing, Johanna's put it, putting up a conference now. This, the, her position with Chamber is one year long. She's putting up a conference where she's getting uh, Jennifer Kismat and Jan Gell from Copenhagen to, to come to Winnipeg and help us sort of change the mindset of people that are decision makers and so on, and slowly getting into, the, into mayor's ears and premier's ears and so on. Um, I guess the Forks is our port, two rivers. Um, Cross at the forks, hence the forks, and the, uh, these are some some of the best people we can uh, we've ever worked with. Uh, they've engaged us to design a brewery uh, for for the um, for the forks. Gave us a portion of an old market. This used to be stables. Said, hey, in this north end, you might be able to do to do to do that. But when we looked at it, uh, we've sort of discovered that there's no capacity in existing floors to put a brewery. There's all kinds of underground things happening. And said, the only way you can do it is by building something outside, but you don't have much site. As you can see there, there will be a footprint of a brewery. And through our research, <coughs> excuse me, I'm rather sick. Through our research, uh, we've, we've stumbled upon this thing called um, gravity-fed brewery. Uh, so beer used to be made by uh, pumping the uh, or augering grains on the top top floor and then sort of filtering through the system and drinking it at the bottom. And so the uh, you know looking back at the market, there was a freight elevator, so we would not have to incur that cost. And if we stacked our program on top of each other, we would actually fit it on site next to the existing building. So here you can see the process starting from storage through the uh, fermentation and the, at the end, uh, sorry, cooking and then at the end fermentation and off to the, off to the cool box, how it actually would work nicely in the, uh, through the system or through the vertical system of the brewery, as you can see, see there. Uh, it's attached to a historic building, so the way it touches uh, into this historic building is, is quite, um, quite sensitive. Uh, the only attachment points are going through existing window openings, as you can see here, showing on through these diagrams, and then the thing kind of explodes inside and creates a creates for a tasting room. Um, the um, One of the things that it did on the site, this is sort of a dead end of the site, so it's, it's trying to create an interest, trying to create a visual marker, uh, and trying to also speak to the uh, speak to the processes that happen inside, so the entire idea of, of these apertures is showing different parts of the process through the, uh, through the uh, I guess, cycle of beer making. And we'll I talk about the next maybe one. Maybe I would just add that um, <clears throat> I think we started from um, sort of just fitting geometry together and trying to fit these housing blocks together and making financial sense of it and trying to carve architecture out of that. And it, sort of, I guess, self-consciously thinking like, well, is that it? Is that all we can do? And um, I think now getting different types of commissions that aren't just housing, we have a bit more leverage to um, try to figure out the basic elements of, of light and, and, and form and what that can do. And I guess the, the brewery is one where we're trying to sort of filter the quality of light and, and see if we can learn from that. But I think that's going to be a long, uh, lifetime long What quest. are you trying to say? Well, you heard what I said. Yeah, I did, but you I don't no buy idea. any of I, that? No, I understand, I understand what you're saying. That we're trying to sort of explore other avenues of architecture rather than just the geometry, are we not? I always thought we were, but yeah, all right. before yet. Okay, all right. Uh, I think we should also do something else, but like Cortan, because I'm just realizing. Um, <laughs> this is a house that, uh, just shifting scale slightly, uh, a house that we uh, did for a client that we just couldn't get anything out of. Uh, I don't know if you can picture this, but when you have a house client, it's very personal. It's quite different from going to do housing because your client doesn't really exist. The end user, you can't talk to them. Uh, <clears throat> in this particular case, we had a couple, and, and sometimes they have really interesting stories. You can like dive into them, you can get inspired by them. But these two were as vanilla as it gets. They were two Mennonites. <laughs> they had, I, not, not that there's anything wrong with being a Mennonite, this is a very typical condition in, in Winnipeg. And, um, and just really nice people. 
And there was no skeletons in their closets. They didn't have any weird hobbies. Um, just like regular nothing, people. Nothing to and latch so onto. It, we, we talked about this for like months. On Except end. that they heard us and said, we want a house in this neighborhood that was built in the 80s. So you can see here the what the surrounding buildings are. And they, they discovered this lot that was never sold and they uh, basically bought it and brought us in and said, you can do whatever you want. We don't want a house to be ostentatious, and we don't want to ask for any variances, so fit it in whatever the requirements or whatever the zoning and allows And they wanted a bungalow. <laughs> that was a yeah, they wanted a bungalow, which was sort of a very they important They had two house. kids, two small kids at the time, and, and uh, by the time you finished the house, they had a third one. But mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so really what happened is that uh, the guy kept talking about the backyard, and he kept saying like how amazing the site <coughs> was because it had trees, and and that how he wanted to build a hockey rink there for his son and things like that. And so at some point, and I, it sounds so silly now that I say it, we just decided to sort of crank no, it. No, we, we had a reason. That's the reason. Oh, I see. He wants okay. more yard. No. What then? No. <laughs> yeah, he did. No, it was a bungalow conversation, right? So the we, basically... That's part of it. No, yes. no, no. Yes, you're totally messed, you, she totally messed it up. So erase okay. your memories now. This is garbage. So... <laughs> So the deal was this: they were really wanting a bungalow, but could not fit all the um, all the all the windows it facing the forward and back. Yeah, yeah, they couldn't fit all the windows yeah. facing forward and back in a in a regular bungalow. Once you look at the width of the lot, it was I think 60 feet. Okay, the house was 60 there. feet wide, right? Cool so there. I'm pointing to it right now. <laughs> so <laughs> there were setbacks that were predetermined, right? So the, uh, that was uh, that was the width of the house. <coughs> Excuse me. So basically, the uh, by the time you fit three bedrooms and the uh, and the garage or triple car garage because this is outside of a city and the entrance and the uh, and the living room and kitchen and everything else, there's not enough perimeter to face, you know, forward and backwards for the house. So basically, because he wanted simple, every room, every room to face, to face the backyard or the front which or the front. Want. No, the backyard. When was the last time you were in the house? Like no, there's a bedroom goodness. facing forward. So anyway, anyway so the what happened is by by skewing the plan. Uh, the, the area remains the same, however, the, uh, the amount of perimeter increases, in particular perimeter facing front and backyard. So it went from 60 feet to almost 100 feet on either one, which allowed us to make the house a bungalow, as you can see here. The, um, and, the, uh, and again, the entire house was sort of inspired by the forest that it fits, uh, that sits in. It's, it's sort of a prairie forest. This is as dense as the forest gets in the prairies, and then try to... Um, sort of play off of that access to, to light with large overhangs on, on uh, west and east and then carrying the entire rhythm of the vertical um, screen inside the, uh, inside the building. As you can see there. I, I was you hoping to speak a bit about a plan that you've no, gone through again. very quickly. No, it's put it on every picture. You have plenty of opportunity. That was the only way to get, a, get to the plan. So really, this is the front of the house. That's the back of the house, the three-car garage. Right there, the entrance, the, uh, the living space is surrounded by, if you wish, a service block with one bedroom and then another bedroom there with the master bedroom on the side. So the, that triangle of the living space is defined by two screens that then carry around the wrap around the house and become structure on the outside. So that's a fairly sort of clean way of thinking about a plan with, a, again, a service block, a box sitting right in the middle of the house that contains a pantry, a... Uh, Closet, entry closet, and the bathroom for the kids here. And then the, uh, everybody in Winnipeg bins, builds basements because the soil is so bad, they have to excavate anyway. Right. So there you go. There it is. Yeah. Um, and then, I guess, going from that architectural culture activism now to actual sort of what, what we would think is, is real activism and making a difference, um, we met uh, some amazing uh, people from Mexico City uh, just in architectural conferences over the years and became good friends <coughs> and um, two years ago then or no a year ago this was March last year right? March last year time flies um, <coughs> they invited us back to Mextropoli which is uh, Latin America's largest architectural conference to build a an installation um, some sort of a public project that would um, would be able to animate the space. And uh, we worked with the Mexican team and, and one of our uh, team members actually at 546 is also from Mexico City, trying to come up with something meaningful uh, for the, the local conditions. And, and it turns out, and you saw in the beginning slide there, is that um, 
there are uh, these little entrepreneurs in, in Mexico City called Viene Viene, and, and what they are uh, uh, are guys... Little entrepreneurs. Yeah, they're entrepreneurs. <laughs> they take uh, regular painter's buckets and they mark off public no, space. Fill them up with concrete. Okay, is that really important to very, the story? Very critical. Anyway, and, and they put, that, put those into the uh, public space to claim parking stalls. And then they charge the person who parks there money for parking there. Uh, so basically losing public space. Uh, the police is kind of in on this. It's a bit corrupt. Uh, they won't stop them. And then if you don't pay them, then they vandalize your car. It's a billion dollar industry in Mexico City. They don't have public parking as we know it in North America. So it's very, very So it's curious. really interesting. And so we wanted to take this painter's bucket and do something else with it. So to reclaim the public space back to the, to the people um, of the city, and, and so this uh, one bucket at a time project was sort of born from, from that. And then, of course, it's interesting because the bucket is slightly tapered, and so there's an opportunity to, to tie the buckets together, and the actual form of the bucket allows it to start to curve. And so we played with that and, and came up with the system. Do you have a back picture in here? Yeah, there's a back picture. Yeah. Um, anyway, so it has rope basically behind here. Um, the team spent about a week building this on, on site and in different sections, and it actually flipped over a couple of times, and people were really climbing on it, so not the most safe thing in the world. Um, but then uh, we, it was really So the buckets popular. are really woven in, in, the, in behind on no a 60, 60 degrees, 120 degree uh, ropes that run through the buckets and hold them together, and then everything else is done through gravity and filling up buckets with sand in order to hold the tip um, tilted and so on. And it ended up being Arch Daily's most uh, liked Instagram photo of all time <coughs> in, in Mexico City at the time, last year in March. And then we had the idea, or somebody had the idea, who had the idea to bring it back to Design Festival in Winnipeg and it's in September. And what we thought we would do is try to, these, these buckets were coming from Mexico City, that we would try to send them back full uh, with Winnipeg's goodwill and the Canadian goodwill. And so we were able to collect $10,000 for an orphanage, a uh, girls' orphanage uh, in Mexico City. By building That's a really pavilion in, in Winnipeg, which we don't have a picture of for yes, some reason. But anyway, there you go. Um, so this, this should be the last project. Let's is this the last project? Well, it isn't, but let's make Ish. it. Ish. That. Okay. Yeah. How how much time do you really no, want no, us no, to talk? No, we're done after this. Okay, we're gonna just it. call it a day. Okay. Yeah. So this is the parkade that we got a fifty million dollar project that we said uh, uh, after we finished in that Calgary. shed in Calgary, right? For the uh, for the same client. So. They gave us a site, it was intersected by underground uh, metro line, and so that was a sort of a no-build zone. And the, uh, we, of course, and they said, go build on one side or on one half or the other half. So as, we, as we've looked through it, we talked about, you know, we discovered all kinds of connectivity opportunities. They wanted the uh, architecture to be memorable. And the, when you're building large parkade structure, this is for 510 cars. Let's uh, talk about the program. It, it so it's a parkade of the future. Oh, right. That's Yes, so we have part, 510 yeah. cars that we have to accommodate now, but it's the last project that Calgary Parking Authority is ever going to build, according to them, because they believe that car ownership, and it is actually true, car ownership is going down. So this is, you know, the, the height of it, and then we're going to start reducing from there. So parkade of the future in this case means that there are other uses within the parkade and that it has to be convertible to, to other functions in the, in the future. So those were the parameters on which we were. Right. So working. from the get-go, we had to be able to turn it either into residential or, or commercial without knowing what, what is going to happen um, over the years. So that, that has all kinds of impacts on structure and the way you think about the floor-to-floor -floor height and the shape and the depth of the building and so on. And so we've gone through a variety of sort of, I don't want to call them dead ends, but variety of options. I think we end up with something like 17 different options as we move through the process. Again, trying to reimagine on how the building could get reinterpreted or reused um, in the future, either through the um, sort of a relatively open uh, ground floor uh, by, by tucking most of the parking underneath or uh, looking at actually a systematic approach and then filling in the cells of this. So all of these were fairly uh, strong theoretical sort of um, thoughts that, that had helped us uh, understand how the process or how the project could actually um, become parquet today and then convert into something else. And so, of course, our, our sort of knack for efficiency, if you wish, or knack for, um, for 
deriving geometry out of the program uh, c came through and then we understood the most efficient way we can think about parking is if we can think about a single spiral, the spiral is up the site. Uh, however, the depth of the site has determined rather quickly that we have to split the building into two sections because we need to get light for the future uses into the uh, It could certainly work building. as a parkade, but for any other use, that would be way too deep at 150 feet. Um, so again, this is one of the intermediate renderings looking at how, uh, how programs, at that time they were looking at programs kind of weaving into the into the parkade and the, uh, we ended up with one tenant who is actually part of it. But uh, one of the important discoveries was that the, uh, the site is so big that if you slope the floor at one and a half percent, you can actually just wrap it in a very subtle, very subtle spiral. At one and a half percent, I, I bet every, every surface in this space is at that slope, nothing is really horizontal. So when you think about it, that actually from con convertibility perspective, it becomes an opportunity because you can actually um, develop continuous office space if you wish, or continuous, continuous apartments. Um, remember that round building? Uh, that, that was sort of very easy for us to figure out how to fit the apartments around the uh, curved Perfect. end. Mm -hmm. The rest is obviously very simple. So this is sort of just the proof of concept of how the, uh, how the apartments could fit within the same structure, keeping the floor plate relatively, shadow, so it's relatively shallow so we have light coming from both sides. This is all in the future. So at the moment, this is what the parkade looks like on the ground floor. We're working with an um, um, entrepreneurial organization that's looking at about 55,000 uh, square feet of very, very raw space. Uh, they're really an innovation center, an accelerator, business and accelerator, and a maker space, which you're all familiar with and so on. So that's part of the program. So they start on the ground floor in these turd-shaped um, <laughs> spaces, uh, the parking, so sort of spirals around, goes up the ramp, and then continues up the building, resulting in a sort of... And we're still actively working on the design, but one of the major uh, things then was that uh, the Innovation Center was first on the sixth floor, and then it, uh, through various discussions, ended up dropping to the first and second floor. And then we had to somehow get by that uh, with the car. I got really excited about this idea of the car driving through the Innovation Center and at the center of the parkade and the sort of weird mix of the car and the, and the user, the sort of pedestrian type user. So you can uh, see that illustrated on the left hand side. So this is what, where the building is at right now. Uh, it's a fairly rigid frame, uh, if you wish, that again uh, allows itself to be, uh, to be um, inhabited later uh, with a mesh uh, envelope that connects basically the uh, oblong um, rectangle on top, curved rectangle with the uh, rectangular shape of the site. Um, these are some renderings showing how but the space underneath the parkade, um, a parkade will be. We're looking at using uh, traffic mirrors as a, as a finish on the facade, on the, on the, I guess, most important facade, which would be the one where pedestrians are, and then uh, demonstrating, the which is the soffit, and then demonstrating how that all feels like inside uh, in that future atrium, if you wish, but now open air space. Do you want to leave it there? Uh, yes, just a couple of concluding words uh, while you flip through those those other things. I'll flip through that? You're going to yeah, talk yeah. about something else? I'm going to talk about something else. Okay, let's so see how that works out. Um, I guess we are at the point now we've been in practice for 10 years and are discovering this a master planning exercise that we're doing in Winnipeg to try to increase density. It's an 11 acre site um, and there's a bunch of other developers and architects working. We're just sort of the master planners of it, trying to prove again that density at the smaller scale, at six story maximum, works well because you can have spaces that are really human scale in between and, and so on. And as we're going through that process, are discovering all of the avenues in which architects can take part in and, and be part of, and that the opportunities are hyper local. In this case, we're a slow growth city. Building towers doesn't make any sense in Winnipeg. They take years and years to develop. And so, actually kind of discovering the local unique uh, conditions, whether it's economic conditions, whether it's uh, climatic. cultural, climatic, um, uh, social conditions, are I think that sort of the, all of the avenues that you have as future architects and, and architects maybe now uh, to, to build on and to drive from. And it isn't as singular as, you know, you, you start a practice and, and you start, you know, doing projects, uh, practice is just one avenue in which I think we all have to act in and to create better conditions for ourselves as, as profession, but also uh, better conditions for the cities and the inhabitants of the cities that uh, we're all part of. 
And I think it's an inspiring prospect. I think there are so many different avenues that you as architects can be. Uh, being a sort of star designer isn't the only way. Uh, again, there's you know the politics, there's city building, there is, I don't know, chair design. There's all kinds of things that you can do. And, and sometimes we, all, we dream about being back in school and, and actually knowing that, knowing the stuff that we know now, because it is so exciting and the opportunities are vast. And uh, we wish you all the best of luck and, and uh, thank you for having us here today. That's going to be the worst slide to end on, eh? No, I didn't end on it. Thank you. There. Is there well, thank you very much. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you very much for your conference. It was very inspiring and certainly very entertaining as well. Uh, I will start with a first question. Uh, you spoke of standard construction materials uh, in today's architecture and the limitations they bring in most projects and that you use these limitations to go beyond what is possible. So I'd like to know how and mostly when do these limitations come into consideration in your projects? I think they, they're always there. Uh, the projects that we feel the best about are the ones that actually have discovered whatever the limitations are, whether it's the site or material or budget or whatever it is, and then design from there. And, you know, the luxury of time is usually uh, non-existent, so you kind of stumble upon these as you, as you move through the projects. But the, um, it, what, I, what really excites us about the idea of, of a limitation is that then uh, there's very little you can take away uh, from, from architecture because it's intrinsic into what you're doing, right? So if you, if you know that this is the only thing that you can do and this is how you discovered it, then that's what it is. And the story actually, that it becomes a story of the project. So that, that's one of the reasons we rarely talk about design in our projects. We rarely talk about proportion or talk about um, alignments. We worry about all those things like every other architect does, right? Every other sort of self-respecting self architect does. But what's it really interests us is how, we, how do we find column limitations, column parameters, column whatever it is, and then use that to inspire the project and, and create a project and then and actually build the story. And then in the end, if you didn't add anything extra, no, those extras can't be taken away through value engineering, which is sort of our biggest enemy always. Uh, that you think you got something great and then it's like, well, it's $9 million over budget, like in the case of the parkade, um, you know, several times over. And so then what is the essence of the project? What makes it still something exciting but that there's no, there's sort of no extras? So it, it isn't, architecture isn't about just applying money on it. I mean, I think we all know that but often forget it throughout the process. Yeah, it's, there, there's, like we're trying to define it for us over years and over the years, and the uh, one one of the way we think, one of the ways we think about the projects is they should be what they should be and not more, right? And so that's relatively easy not to sort of overdo your project. It's really hard to decide when to start cutting, and what helps you from understanding when you stop cutting is an understanding what the project is about. So if we can know what the project is about and actually build that as opposed to frills and thrills and all the things that, that, that come on top of it, screens, et cetera, et cetera, then these projects are truly what they are and what they should be, right? And the often as we go design away, you know, Johanna is particularly good at this, she will ask a question, so what? And, the, uh, and that's sort of a very good question for us as designers and I would encourage everybody else to, to, to sort of, to think that way when you, when you design and when you, you know, finishing your project for studio and there it is, it, you know, it screams and yells and all, all kinds, of, uh, kinds of ways. Is this the best way to do that, right? So what if it actually, you know, defies gravity? I mean, that would be really good if you can figure that out. But, you know, the, the questions are... <laughs> that we ask ourselves, so we've done this, is it actually worth no, spending money on that? You should apply the theory to your words. And stop. Economy. Just the essence of it. Essence. <laughs> <laughs> done. Thank you Thank for you. the question. Hi. Um, I guess it's a follow-up question on the notion of limitation. Uh, two big questions in the profession right now is, um, can we go through a project uh, with naiveness or cleverness. So I was wondering with your notion of limitation, are you trying to be more clever than the client or are you going through just trying ideas, being naive about the, the question? 
and I also, oh, yeah, sorry, go just ahead. Just a se quick second part. Um, also, do you believe uh, of yourself as an author or just like a kind of super smart computer that just gets a limitation and then throws out a, a project? Uh, oh, um, hmm. Well, I don't think we ever try to, to answer your first question. I don't think we're trying to trick our clients. I think we're just trying to figure out where they could realize the value. So it's an honest pursuit. I think, I think soon enough when we start working with a new client, they know that we care deeply about the outcome. Like that's the one thing I can say. I can't claim that we're good or great or, or, or whatever. Expensive or uh, careless. None of that. It's just like we, we really care about the outcome. And then for us to try to within the parameters that exist, which is usually a budget and it's some sort of site limitation, um, in a given parameter, uh, oftentimes site is obviously given to you, so I don't get to pick it. There are those limitations there anyway. And so the, the, the question is always, what can we do within those parameters that serve their needs, uh, whether it's a profit need or whether it's some sort of a social need, and then create architecture um, on top of that. Uh, and not on, on top of that in a way of, of frills and gimmicks, but you know, from Building it, from that, yeah. built into yeah. it. Um, and as far as your second question, are we the, are we the super smart? No, we're definitely not a super smart computer. No, no, his comp the, the super smart computer do the thing. Nobody asked you if you're a super smart computer. Oh, I see. Could they do it? I don't know. That's an interesting proposal for future. Like maybe there is a way that you can generate outcomes. I mean, we're not, as you can probably <coughs> tell, we're not parametric architects by any means. Uh, that is not, you know, we build models, mostly physical models still about everything. We look at it. and. And that's our sort of process. And uh, yeah, I do wonder because it's it's a, it's a series of decisions that, that build up, right? It's not a one decision that that solves it all, right? And yeah. every decision you make modifies something else within the project. So then then you, then you go to go to that. Like the, the, the one of the things that we the projects we get to work with are we like to think of them as real in a way that they're sort of you're in the trenches. A lot of our clients are actually developers and builders at the same time. So what happens? If our projects are not robust enough, or design is not robust enough, they can decide without ever talking to us about changing something, right? Because they, they realize it's going to save them money. They're builders. You go to the site and wonder what in the world has just appeared. My favorite anecdote is, is the Herzog de Miran, who I hope you all uh, uh, know, are driving to see the, um, the uh, Beijing. Uh, there's, a, there's a documentary, don't see the, the Beijing uh, bird's, bird's nest? nest. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I certainly hope they did not facet those curves because they didn't know what's going to happen in China because somebody could have decided to do that. And there was conversations about it. They come there and then, you know, big, sign, big of sort of <laughs> sign of relief. Oh, they didn't, right? So the project has turned out the way they imagined it and so on. So that happens to us all the time. So we, that's sort just, of. Can I just say something? Yes. So, but I so recently did one of the, uh, the chamber luncheon things on automation. And what's interesting is that um, there are stats that over 90% of accounting jobs will be automated over the next 10, 20 years. And it's because if you can define what you do every day, then there's a, there's a fair chance that's going to get automated. And that technology is developing. Uh, three, three things that will are least likely, uh, one is sort of social, um, what would you call that? The social, like, you know, if you're a personal caretaker or something uh, of, of people, so, so healthcare related, that will not because you need sort of human social capital uh, that cannot be automated yet anyway. Uh, the second one is so creative power. So good news for all of us, right? We're going to become more important, hopefully, in the future. And I forget what the third is. I think Doesn't I matter. stopped creative there. I found the creative power, so that was good. Yeah. But so I don't think so because there's something still intrinsic that's very human that we have to discover that it isn't just a system, it's not a formula. Uh, there's always, you know, some type of discovery that goes to the gut of how we feel as people. I would say you're going to make thousands, if not million, decisions on any given project, right? And the question is, while the computer can generate them, somebody still has to make a decision which, you know, at every step, which, which alternative to go with. Because I'm sure a computer could, could generate all the steps. Hi, uh, we're kind of the question group. Right? You guys are just the three of you, like, <laughs> wow. So thanks for an amazing conference. And uh, I, uh, so, uh, the, the honest part of it, the, the, the kind of we're, we're seeing you as, a, as inv individual in real life and not just as pictures. 
So my question is more about the, the fact that you talked about a lot about economics and uh, how architecture needs to get in politics and to share ideas with people that are not in, in, the, in the architecture field. You, you were talking a, lo uh, a lot about economics, but is there another way to get the message through or to get ideas through, do you think? Or we are purely products of our own environment, right? So we've, we've thought, so we've analyzed it, obviously, and stumbled upon this as a sort of our pursuit. I think every environment is different, and I, I think there's many other avenues that one can take. But the, I think the message was more of getting involved and engaged rather than, and find your own way, rather than, hey, this is how you do it. This is, this, this is the only way to do it. I can tell you where it's coming from me. Like, I, I grew up in a culture where uh, an architect was on the money, like on our bill. Alvaro Alto was on the 50 mark bill. And I sort of knew his name uh, from ever since I was probably four years old. I knew that this was something to sort of to aspire to. And it sort of struck me when I, I came to Canada, especially in the prairies and in sort of the rural environment that I spent the first while in, in Canada, where there's absolutely no sort of awareness at all, I felt, of your, your sort of built environment around you and, and what it could do and how much it has to do with how you feel on a daily basis, how it has to do with your... Uh, your health, your your well-being, you like how you feel inspired or how your spirit is lifted because you're in an amazing space. So that's all a dialogue that we can have, but some people are not focused on this and maybe it's the culture of the sort of individual and that's less about the communal, I don't know what it is, but, but that language was just not accessible. It didn't seem to produce any results for us. So I hope that someday we can talk about the sort of true values of architecture directly about how amazing the space is to, to be in and what the height and the proportion do for us and our experience. But until we're there, I think we have to use the language of, of numbers that you know any economist can sort of break down and, and believe in. Thank you very much. Thanks. Are there any addi additional questions? Yes. Actually, it's not a question, it's just a closing remark. Uh, thanks to you, Winnipeg sounds really fun now. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for the lecture, and I invite you to grab a glass of wine and continue the, the discussion with us. So thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry I came a bit late, uh, and in fact, it, it's not so much of a question, but uh, well, uh, we worked together on uh, a project a long time ago for the Venice Biennale, and um, it's uh, when I, I, I got to know you, and um, like, as from this point, I, I really like every project you you you've mentioned you showed us and uh, well I just want to say uh, I really uh, admire all that and you are a great uh, inspiration and in finally uh, the it's uh, I think it's nice uh, the the discussion you make with all the projects uh, the, the the political uh, uh, positions you, you you are willing to to, to take uh, on the, the public space. And I think this, this part of uh, this, this debate is, is good, in fact, uh, especially in, well, in, in Canada, uh, where we are not, well, from the outside, we are not so much uh, seen as a, like some place uh, to go wow, like Copenhagen or say, let's say uh, things mm -hmm. like that. But I think it's admirable that uh, firms like you uh, uh, do uh, such a nice work and get uh, to to be known around the world and I, I think uh, this is really admirable so thank you for that and a great conference thank you, <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna read oh that, thank you so much I appreciate the comment it's so nice to see you again <laughs> can't wait to chat more yeah I have a beer now <laughs> okay.